It is uh, part eight of our study on Revelation. And as I said at the very, very beginning, my goal in going through the book of Revelation is not to talk about all the weird things and the interpretations and who's who and all of this, all the symbolism, but to find in the book some principles, some exhortations, some truths that are relevant for us today, for the church and all generations. So this morning, I was led uh, to talk about understanding the Lamb. You know, this is uh, wonderful to realize, and I, I had never seen it before I did that study, that John, the Apostle John, is the one who used this expression, the Lamb, the most. Actually, he used one word that only him used about the Lamb, it is mentioned 30 times in the New Testament, and 28 of these are in the book of Revelation. So that is something very significant to the Lamb. You will notice that when, when even throughout the chapters in the book of Revelation, when John talks about the throne of the Lord of God and of the Lamb, he, he could have said the throne of Christ at that point. But no, he, he maintained and all the time to use the Lamb as Jesus Christ instead because the Holy Spirit led them to do this and it, that is significant for us. So this morning, it's like we're going through the book of Revelation. It's like God giving us like 3D glasses. For some of you, I know you are crazy about 3D TV. <laughs> and and, and you, if you don't wear your, your, your 3D glasses, then there are details, uh, the effect that you will not be able to, to grasp. Or X-rays vision, like Superman can see through the walls, or something like this. So, so what we have with the book of Revelation is access to see something that is of the other world, something that is of the glory to come, and we can see it because it is our privilege. John was in a prison, but his eyes was open, his ears were attentive, and God gave him a series of visions that he commanded him to pass on to us. So this is our privilege this morning. So I want to turn to Revelation chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, that is our first text. We, we've looked at this chapter before in another context when we looked at the four uh, horsemen of Revelation and the judgment that came. But this morning I want to stress looking at the lamb. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. But it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represents the sevenfold Spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. So we see a lamb. A lamb that looks like he has been slaughtered. So we may ask some questions also in the background of that text, because I start in verse 6. But in verse 2, there is a voice asking the question, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break the seals? Who is worthy? So what does being worthy have to do with being able to open the scroll? What does this worthy mean? And what does it, uh, what it have to do with opening the scroll? Only a worthy person was allowed. And the, the Bible is very clear that no one in heaven, on earth, under the earth, dead or previously, no one, no great prophets or, or some kind of a, a divinity or, you know, fake, fake, fake gods or whatever. Nobody, only uh, Jesus Christ. What happens when the seals were broken? This is the time when the judgment of God, the revenge of God, was going to uh, begin. What is, about, what is it about Jesus Christ that makes him worthy to, to open the scroll? Because only him, obviously, is able to do that. And then we read that in the context that John was weeping bitterly when the voice announced that no one was found in all eternity, and all the story of mankind, no one was worthy to open, and he just wept. 
and wept. And why, why was he so uh, crying in that, in that sense? Why? Because no one could break the seals and that scroll is the, our redemption, the book of our redemption and our salvation and nobody was able to do that. We have a background that we want to go quickly over to understand the role of the Lamb and who is the Lamb in this book. We all know that the Bible is the book of redemption. We all know that the Bible teaches how God responds to the problem of man. Since the fall of man, man had the problem in their relationship with God. I think we all understand that from the book of Genesis. So God is going to respond to man's problem. He's coming with a, with a plan and a solution uh, to, to that. And this plan runs throughout all history. The Lamb of God is a thread that runs through all history of redemption. And you can go back to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, you will see that there is a first mention of a prophecy talking that the plan of God will always have a fight between Satan forces and a special seed who would be wounded but eventually would emerge victorious. So we know who it is because we are, we are now living in the end times and we have the New Testament to attest to that. But already in Genesis chapter 3, 15, it was being prophesied. And then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, God is the first to make the first garment of skin. So the first uh, uh, animal sacrifice for <coughs> sin has been done by God himself in, in uh, Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis 22, we find a picture of Abraham who was commanded to go on the mountain and offer his son Isaac to God. But God says, do not hurt your son. And there was a substitute, a ram, that was caught up there that could be offered instead. And these are pictures of us for us to understand the role of the lamb and the thread that you will see a, a sacrifice of animals for sin throughout the story of redemption. Now we fast forward a bit and we go to Egypt with uh, Moses and Pharaoh who enslaved the people of Israel. And then God sent his last of ten plagues that made every firstborn child of every household that were killed. But for the people of God, there was a way of escape. But all, every household, every firstborn of the Egyptian, there was a death in their home. And then for the people of God, they were told, to sacrifice a lamb, take the blood, and place the blood on the post of the doorstep. And then when the, the angel of death would come that night, the one who killed all the firstborn of all the Egyptians' family, when he would see the blood over the door, then he would pass over, and then they would escape the judgment of the angel of death. And this became the most graphic picture of how God would deal with sin. That became the main picture of all time. All of it revolved around a lamb that would be killed and whose blood would be what saves people from the future judgment of God. And that is the picture, the graphic picture that God gave us. And that, that is so profound that the Lamb becomes one of Christ's most significant titles. And we have a slide here, John chapter 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Acts chapter 8 verse 32, here when the eunuch was traveling from Jerusalem, he was reading in the book of Isaiah, and Philip was sent by the Holy Spirit to speak with him. And the passage that the eunuch was, was reading was this, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. And we, this is a a wonderful, wonderful fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. And then we read in that chapter that starting with this text, 
then uh, he explained the good news of Jesus Christ and the man was saved and he was baptized. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. And this is all over the New Testament, the term especially used uh, by John most of the time. And this is a perfect picture that we see in uh, Exodus chapter 12. There's a principle in the Old Testament that we need to understand in order to appreciate fully the, 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 the sacrifice of the cross. It's the principle of substitution. And we have 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Or, and I added another version, the New Living Translation, just for uh, an add-on. To be the offering for our sins, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him, or that we could be made right with God through Christ. I want to talk about the expression here, made to be sin, because this is maybe causing confusion when you, you read that. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin. So that does not mean that God made Jesus to become a sinner. That is not what it means. Please do not understand it in this way. But also it is more than what the New Living Translation mentions here, that to be the offering for our sin. It is even more than that, what happened there. When it says, he made him to be sin for us, that means that uh, he became the representative of sinful man, him who knew no sin, spotless, sinless, he became the representative, and on him fell the collective consequence of our sins. The sins of all men since the beginning, since the first sin, all the full consequence of sinfulness was placed upon Jesus Christ. And we have a similar text in uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, when it talks about the curse, that we have been redeemed from the curse. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Like trying to go through the law, we are under curse because we cannot accomplish perfectly the requirement of the law. Having become a curse for us, or like the New Living Translation says it well, he took upon himself the curse of our wrongdoing. So there is a substitution here, an exchange. We call 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the greatest exchange. It's, it's like a big contract. It's like, a, this is the most beautiful pictures. I am unworthy, I am a sinner because of my faith. I will receive the righteousness of Christ because Christ Jesus took the full consequence and the, the, the full sinfulness of my sin upon himself when he died. We have a, a, a definition here talking about the lamb. It shows, I, I want to show you a, a word here, the word vi vicarious, because this is something that has to do with substitution. And what does it mean? It means something that is performed or suffered in place of another. Like we, we have an example here, vicarious punishment. And this is exactly what the terminology, the lamb, referred to. When we look in the book of Revelation, it says the lamb that was slain, it always referred to this role, to this character of Jesus Christ, is vicarious punishment the vic for, for me. It took it for someone else. It's taking the place of another and acting or serving as a substitute. And this is very important that we always understand our salvation with this in mind the substitute, what Jesus Christ has done. And then the, all the Old Testament priesthood was based upon this. When the Israelites would sin, they would take a lamb or a, an animal that was prescribed by the law, come to the temple, the priest would receive it, they would confess their sin, lay their hand upon, and then they would uh, slaughter, the blood would be offered, so that means that God accepted the blood of animals. 
that is what God does. But there is a problem. There was a problem. And the book of Hebrews explained it to us. Hebrews 10, 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. It was a type. It was for a season covering sin, but not taking it away and solving the problem of sin once and for all. Jesus only has done that. So there was a problem with the blood of animals. So only Jesus Christ was spotless, sinless, perfect representative for man and could offer his, 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 himself in our behalf. And always Pay attention when we talk about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's always for us. The, the, the word for us, it's always important. The substitute, he died for us, in behalf of us, because of us. He took our punishment upon himself. That is very important. There's another true that we need to understand also when we look at the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation. Because when you, when you look at the content of the book of Revelation, you are being shocked by the severity of God, by the harsh judgments, by the anger of God that is called the, the wrath of God in, in the New Testament. And, and you, you wonder, like, is that really the God that we always like to present like the God of love, like a, well, it, it seemed to conflict with ourselves. But it is something that we need to, to understand. The Lamb in the book of Revelation is what we call the wrath or the anger remover. The one that will uh, prevent us from being under this anger, this fury uh, of God. There's a side of God that we don't hear a lot about, but it is important that we do, because it is part of the good news. Remember I told you before, the good news has a, has a bad news with it. And it becomes a good news when you realize what the bad news is. And the bad news is that you have a problem, and a big problem. And the Lamb of God, good news, is the one that removes the bad news, the effects of the bad news, and turns it into uh, good news. What does wrath mean in the New Testament? It is an intense anger or fury or rage towards something. So when we t talk about the wrath of God, you, you need to, to see the, the application of that. An intense anger or rage toward sin. God hates sin. And we need to, to, to be refreshed with that. And I believe that we forget or have lost the, the connections of the full meaning of what, what does that mean. Sin what is sin to God? Because we seem quite comfortable with sin. We are quite tolerant with sin. We excuse ourselves and justify ourselves very quickly about practicing sin. Or we categorize sin and we take it lightly. And it's not a big deal if I, I have problems with this sin or practice this. We have lost this touch uh, this fear of God and this knowledge of the wrath of God and this fierce anger and fury against what sin is. Hello? Are you there? Yes. This is the same God. This is the same God we're talking about. So God has an intense anger or rage against sin. You know, this is the truth that brought me to be saved. That's that the truth of the anger and the judgment of God. I was not drawn to Jesus by his love. I was not drawn to Jesus by uh, sweet music or whatever it was. I was drawn to Jesus when I was watching a movie on the end times. And the commentator in that movie, after we saw so many judgments that was going to happen when Jesus would return and the prophecies of his returns and all the horrible things that was going to happen, then the voice of the commentator said something like, And this God, who has the power and authority over all nature, is coming and he will judge sinner. <laughs> oh, when I heard that, 
my heart just melt. I says, Lord, I give you my heart. Really, really. So what, what draw me to Jesus to, be, to want to be saved was the fear of this judgment. So that's not a bad message at all. You see, I've been uh, involved in the church here years ago. Some of you re would remember that, uh, Heaven's Gate and Hell's Flame, this most wonderful and powerful drama I ever uh, presented for salvation. And it is very radical. Some pastors refuse to have this drama presented in their church. Uh, this is not right to force people into heaven by fear. That's what they would say. But this drama is so clear. You go to hell, or you go to heaven. And this is made of short scenes of everyday life, mothers and daughters, father and son, uh, two secretaries finishing work, groups of teenagers going on the parties, short scenes, and then in every scene there's an accident and they all die. And then, and then they just wake up with all of this aluminum fold and big spots and the angels all over and the higher ceiling, the most glorious scenes you can have. And it's really with the music and the sound effect and everything and you get like <laughs> goosebumps and everything and all this and then it makes you realize and think about this moment and all this and then when they come before the, the great angel with the book of life. Angel, angels, my name should be in the book. My name, find it, find it. My mother was a Christian or I used to go to church. Find, find my name. And the angel looks in the books and just looks the books. <laughs> and then when he doesn't have the name, he goes like this. <laughs> And then the lights turn red, and the music gets scary, and the flame of hell start with the fan, with the red cloth, and all of this. And then the demons come from hell and grab the people that are screaming, ah! and they drag them and they push them into hell. And, and this is the part of the drama. <laughs> And then the other part is that when the angel find the names, oh wow, that's when you get a goosebump. And then he just raised his hand and then the hallelujah said, hallelujah. And then Jesus shows him the top of the stairs and, he, and the person who is in love with Jesus run to Jesus and Jesus hug that person. And it is such a wonderful, so the old drama you go from the terror of hell, from different scenes that you can identify with, to the other scenes where people, and in many scenes, one believed Jesus and one didn't. So they get a separation. Sometimes the father and son, or, or no, the father and son both goes to hell. But it was before, because of the father. The father was mocking the mother. The mother was bringing the, 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 the children to, wanted to bring the children to school, but father was, you know, ah, this is for old, old women and things like this. And then at the end, the demon takes the, the father by the hair, lift his face, lift him, says, thank you, dad. <laughs> we almost lost your son. Wow, you, I mean, when you see all of this, and the text is so powerful. Okay, how many wants to get saved right now? Okay. So, anyway, I'm telling you, I, I was not planning to tell you so many details of that, but it's, 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 I really love this, this drama. So anyway, uh, when you see this radical truth, this is hell and this is heaven. Isn't it what the Bible teach? Why is it that in the modern church and the modern messages and in the modern songs and in the modern presentation of the gospel there is very little and almost nothing spoken anymore about the judgment of God, the anger of God, his horrible uh, hatred against sin. It's just not being mentioned. And it is the message of the Bible, people need to be placed in front of their sinfulness so that they can appreciate the, the price that was paid, that they can appreciate the, the lamb that had been slaughtered, that looked like he had been slain, but now he is, he is the victorious one, and the same lamb 
that remove the wrath and the fury of God. This, this same sacrifice is the base for two things. The base for the salvation and the escape of judgment and the base for the verdicts of guilt and the verdict of judgment. The same sacrifice in the same lamb. So that is very, very important. First John chapter 2, verse 2. That is another word that we need to learn in the Bible. For he himself is the propitiation. That is a big word. Propitiation for our sins. For our sins. Again, this expression is back all the time. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Propitiation, what does that mean? Something that appeases and satisfies wrath. So you have a definition of wrath, an intense anger or rage toward sin. And then you have another word, propitiation, that is obtained by the lamb that was slain. That says something that appeases and satisfies wrath. So he is the wrath remover. So that you don't have to be judged and to be under the fury of God because Jesus took it upon himself. And we find it in Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6. You are all very uh, familiar with this. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities because of upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is one of my favorite part. And many of you who have taken the evangelism explosion class, you know this verse by heart. My, my life, my actions, my sinfulness, Jesus Christ. Uh, you know that, huh? He, he, and then it has pleased God to lay upon him the iniquity of us all. So where are my sin? They are on him. He's been punished. The iniquity of us all has been laid upon him. There's a transaction. But for that, you need to appropriate it. And that is the difficulty with many churches or with... Uh, I was raised in the Catholic Church. And in a Catholic church, we knew the idea of that. We, would, we could see Christ is the Savior of the world, for instance. We would see something like that. But we had not appropriated. Like believe and receive. John chapter 1 verse 12. To those who believe and receive in His name, they are given the authority to become the children of God. But until you appropriate it to yourself, you make the work of Jesus Christ applicable to your sinfulness, that you acknowledge that, that you believe who He is, what He's done, the plan of God, and it is for you, then you cannot receive the effect of what the Lamb that was slain has achieved for all of us. There needs to be an appropriation of that. Amen? Amen. Are you still there? Yes. yes. So Revelation chapter 4, 5, verse 4. We, we read that John was weeping bitterly. And then in verse 5, he was told, stop weeping. But there's a reason why. Because he was told, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir of David's throne, has won the victory. And the lamb is becoming like a lion-like lamb. And is becoming like a, a a picture is given to us like to fulfill prophecies again and to show again his identity and the plan of God. The heir or the seed of David, the kingship, the rulership. So this lamb who has come in humility and has been slaughtered, martyred, beaten by man and, and stepped all over is now the king and the ruler of all eternity. He is in charge. He is the commander in chief. He is God. And he is going to settle his account at this time. And then the scroll, the, the picture of the scroll that is handed to 
this lamb or the lion of Judah, the, the seed of David that is given to him is what indicate in the time line of God a change in the role of the Lamb of God. He remains the Lamb, but his role is being changed at that moment. In, at Calvary, the Lamb submitted in obedience to the will of the Father for your sins and my sin. But now, he is entrusted with the judgment of mankind. His role is changed. He remains the Lamb, but his role, he has a dual role, the, the, the Redeemer and the Judge. This is what he's done. Jesus Christ will call all men on account, to account on the day of judgment. And it's, it's a bit surprising that when Jesus Christ is now being uh, given the role of leadership, of so sovereign, and uh, all the, the judgment is given to him, he is now in, in charge of that, in all eternity, that is still being shown with the image of a lamb. You would think that at, at that moment it would be changed into another title, uh, Christ or the King or the Conqueror or the Lion or the, uh, um, something that, that shows might and, and power and greatness. But the Holy Spirit continues to present to us always the lamb, the lamb and the lamb with the, the characteristic that was slain. It, it remains until the end of Revelation, that title, that picture always remains, and that is very, it should be very significant for all of us. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, now having taken the scroll, something happened that didn't happen before. Something happened that is very glorious. The four living creatures, the 24 elders, they fall down before the Lamb. So here is like a, a worship, uh, an action of worship. Worship is due unto Him. And if you look further, I did not quote the old verse for sake of time, but again in chapter 5, verse 11 to 13, you will see millions, it says thousands of thousands and myriads of myriads and myriads of myriads of angels sang a new song, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered, or who was slain. They sing that song, okay? And he is worthy to receive power and glory, honor and might and all of this. And the, and the verse 13 says, they fell down and worship the Lamb. So all creatures will f f f you know, bow down before him in all eternity. And to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, an equal honor and glory is given to God the Father and God the Son on that, on that verse here. It says, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory. And I want to show you a chart quickly to give you a, a bigger picture yet of, of the Lamb of God and the imagery of the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation, the, the last one, the Lamb to whom all judgment is committed. So you, you see throughout the verse, and these are not all the verses, but some of them just to, to, to present to you this expression that continues on into the book uh, of Revelation. The title, The Lamb, to whom all judgment is committed. Chapter 6, verse 1, he opened the first seals and the judgment on earth begins. Verse 16, they cry and fear people of the nations, those who are following the beast, the, uh, and those who have give, been given rulership for one hour with the beast, hide from us, hide us from the wrath of the lamb. And it is like a, a, a picture of contradiction here. A lamb and wrath doesn't go together. A lion and wrath, but not a lamb. But he is now having this role. In chapter 14, verse 10, they must drink the wine of God's anger and they will be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and of the lamb. You see that the pictures of authority, of sovereignty, of being in charge, of settling the account, judgment for all creatures are committed unto the Lamb that was slain. The Lamb, the conqueror of God's enemies. 17, 14. Together they will go to war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will 
defeat them. He's the conqueror. He's, he's, he's in charge. He's the ruler. He's the winner. The Lamb shares power and glory with the Father. And you have a few scriptures that, that stress that. I did not put all of them. For the throne of God and of the Lamb. The throne of God and the throne of the Lamb. It's one throne and they are sitting together and they share uh, the, 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 the worship and all of this. The Lamb is the light of the heavenly and eternal city. And the Lamb is His light. There would be uh, no sun, no moon then. The glory of God will shine in the light of the Lamb. The bride of the Lamb will be revealed. And 21.9 Come with me, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And the Lamb will lead, shepherd, and comfort for the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So this is all about the Lamb. This is how John, the Holy Spirit inspired him to present to us this picture of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. He could have changed his title somewhere in the book, but the Holy Spirit says use that one, this title. Because of our sin, we are separated and we stand guilty before God. We deserve judgment. Therefore, the only hope that we have is the way that God provided to us. And this is shown throughout the Bible and it culminates with the picture of the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross he made atonement, his, his sacrifice satisfied the uh, requirements of God's righteousness and holiness and serves as a payment of a ransom, a price to redeem us for all of us who believe. He is the perfect sacrifice and his resurrection attests and his return to heaven attests that God has accepted the sacrifice once and for all. Your salvation rests secure. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the best message in the whole world. There's no better message or good news. And we do not have to be intimidated to share it. We should not be afraid to do it. We are called to be ambassadors, proclaimers. We should walk with our heads high, not in pride, uh, something that is not, not, not attractive, but in the sense of being acknowledging what Jesus Christ, to be proud of Jesus Christ, to put our glory in what He has done for us and not be shy to share this greatest message. How many Christians have never shared the gospel or almost never shared the gospel because they are intimidated? Maybe people will laugh. Maybe people will not accept it. This is the best, the most beautiful, this is the glorious, this is the power of God unto salvation. So we should be able to, to tell others. And it is the only way of salvation. And this responsibility has been given to you. Hello? Are you there? Okay, so you have a responsibility this morning to take that message and to joyfully and uh, running to the, the hedges and the highways and the byways and share it with someone else. I was reading a story this week and I'm closing with that. There was a, a pastor's daughter who had never shared the gospel to anyone. She was 20 years old and she was afraid. That's why she didn't share the gospel to anyone. But it bothered her that she was like that. So one day she decided that I'm going to overcome my fear. I'm determined. I'm going to find someone and share my faith with. So she met a woman and she just told her about God's plan of salvation and His love. And the woman immediately started to cry. And the, 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 this, this, the one who shared the gospel to the pastor's daughter hugged her because she was crying and crying. So she just hugged her to comfort her. And the, the woman opened her purse and there was a gun. And she says, today 
I was going to kill myself. I was going to the forest just next, and I was going to, I had planned to kill myself. But before I left, I prayed, God, if you are there, send an angel to stop me. And as a sign, he should hug me. And that day, this daughter is for the first time, she overcome her fear, and she hugged this lady, and she received Jesus Christ right there. And that is the beauty and the power of gospel. And this is Satan's best trick to just hinder us, make us believe we can't. It's like a bit, I, I'm repeating what Brother Christian said last week. We must overcome that fear. Why, why should we be afraid? First of all, ask yourself, why should you be afraid of opening your mouth and looking for someone and just affirming what has been the greatest news, the greatest experience of your life, what has transformed your life? Tell somebody how beautiful Jesus Christ is to you and you don't have to be ashamed. That's your personal experience. Nobody can argue with that. I mean, we can... We can argue over uh, arguments, like, uh, uh, is God like this, like this, or is Jesus Christ a, a great prophet? I mean, like, we can argue on things, but nobody can argue on what Jesus Christ has done in your life, and the transformation, and the proof that you have for Him, and just go out there and tell somebody, Jesus Christ is the Lamb that was slain but he is standing and he is like a lion and he is coming for you and as we have seen all the, of the role that he has for you it's wonderful sister penina would you come and lead us in that song that we we sang for your glory because i i thought all the the this morning everything went so so together like that songs that sings about the Lamb of God and the comments, the scriptures that we read at the beginning of the service. Jesus Christ, the book of Revelation, is giving us a privilege to see Him as the Holy Spirit wants us to see Him so that it can energize us again and make us understand this greatest revelation of our salvation. Hallelujah. Would you stand with us?